Hey guys, Cooks here, and welcome to Playing the Bounce. We chat to Brad Wilkinson, aka the Scrum Doctor, former Connacht prop and now rugby union coach. We asked him, Mustafa Benedict, what is actually happening at the bottom of Scrum and what makes it so dark? And Brett, tell us all the secrets. Okay, so Brett, yeah. let's, let's talk about scrums. I mean, it's, it's the contentious issue. Um, I call you the scrum doctor, so I'm going to need a couple of perspectives. <laughs> um, <laughs> walk me through the dark side of the scrum. I mean, what, what makes a scrum a scrum? I mean, and how do scrum coaches actually feel about referees? Because when, when we look at the game now, ref, scrums are quite a contentious issue because scrum coaches or props always look confused when they ping. Yeah. First, first of all, in terms of in terms of referees, um, I believe um, taking decisions out of their hands is probably the best thing to do. And by doing that, it's painting good pictures to referees. Um, so, in terms of Bynes angles, um, very much um, on the head, square and straight, and Bynes high. Um, so that that would be the big thing uh, for me: is just painting good pictures to referees. Don't give them the opportunity because as soon as it goes on the ground. They then have to make a decision. So for me, it's keeping them up. Um, and then in terms of the dark arts, um, I don't have a magic answer, really. It's just, for me, um, it's about pressure. It's about feelings, forces, and angles. And the more you can get your scrum or eight aligned to the same thing, the better. And then the more you can get a movable force in the same direction. So I kind of talk about spines in line straight up the field. If you can get that and all eight buying into a philosophy, a purpose, um, I think then, then you're on to a winner then because then there's obviously a purpose and then you, you, the feelings come into it, the pressures, the forces, the angles, all those things uh, create a force where you can move forward. Brett, um, I mean, I've got to ask, I mean, obviously, in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, they say we, we scrum to attack and sort of ball goes in, goes straight out. In, in, yeah. in the northern hemisphere, obviously the nine puts the ball in and then goes to the ten for the next twenty minutes, and they have a chat while the forwards do the yeah. real work. Yeah. I mean, so like, what what are, what are some of the other differences in scrumming in the southern hemisphere and scrumming in the northern hemisphere? Yeah, that, you you touched on that. I think in the in the southern hemisphere, it's more looked at as a restart um, to play away, whereas in the in the northern hemisphere, it's more of attacking weapon. So you know, especially in the league we're in, um, if you have a good scrum and you have a good maul you'll win your rugby matches so in terms of in terms of us it's like we, we'd hit and get the ball to the eight's feet and then we'd have a crack um and look and scrum for the penalty um so the ball's often trapped there for a couple of seconds if it's nothing we play away and obviously if we start going forward we just keep it in if ref goes penalty advantage we can play away again um i just i just think there's a more a, more, a bigger yeah, focus on it um not saying that there's a there's not a focus on it in the southern hemisphere at all but um that's probably the biggest difference. Yeah, fantastic. So we, we talk about the scrum. I mean, we all know the tight is probably the most important player in the scrum. I mean, every tight end must be able to hold up the scrum. Yeah. Don't, 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 don't fight us flanks there. We, we play a very important role <laughs> inside of the scrum. Someone, someone's going to help hold the, the tight end's leg up. That's well, you guys give the 20%. Plan. You guys give the extra 20% there at the back. Yeah, so we, we'll give the flanks some credit. But... The title props the most important, but who are who are the key who are the key men or women when it comes to scrummaging? For me, it's it's all eight, um, yeah. but I have a big I have a big focus on all eight. So I have a mentality: eight is one, um, and they, and I and I often talk about that. But um, obviously, the title yeah. is the most important there. But he can't function without the others around him. So. In terms of him going forward and all that, it comes from a hooker and a loose head. So when a loose head goes forward through his hooker, that applies pressure to the tight end, which allows him to stay straight and dominate. As soon as there's an outside step on the loose head side or a hooker, a tight head's got to go in, and that's when he can get into trouble. And you often see it where loose heads get under tight heads and drive them across the scrum. And Fred, obviously, when you're playing, I mean, I feel like if you want to know this, I mean, who are some of the, the toughest scrummages that you came against? 
Um, so, yeah, my second year, um, we played Newcastle and there was a prop tight end, Carl Hammond, who played for the All Blacks. Oh, so geez, he, yes. um, <laughs> he was one of my, my first tests I went up against. Um, look, I, I, was, I was so nervous before, but I was all right. I actually did fine. Um, and it gave me confidence. Um, obviously, locked horns with BJ Boerter a lot. Um, so I played at the sports ground before World Cup once in France and played against him there. But then when he was at Ulster and Munster, I used to play against him a lot. Um, Adam Jones was another tough, tough competitor. And does height make a difference? The taller the prop? If you struggle, you struggle more with like the shorter tight head or the uh, taller tight head? Well, like for me as a loose head, I used to, you, you didn't used to worry, but you used to be very wary of the shorter, more squatter tight heads because... Um, they could scrum low and as Alou said it, when, when tight heads take you low it's very difficult to be dominant if, if a tight head sits straight and is low if you want to attack as Alou said the only way you can go is either flip your hips out and in and go try and go across or you just have to stay in that fight at a low level I mean we're talking about scrums quite a bit let's, let's, let's talk about the bottom squat, the spin box for example I mean, the, we've become famous as Africans for having, you, you, you start three really good, tight head, loose head and a hooker, and then they come off the pitch and you've got three world beaters coming on. Like, you're a coach, you're prepping to play the spring box. Like, w- w- what's the plan? It's hard, Ben. It's, it's really hard because um, <laughs> to have quality like that coming on off the bench has got to be con- a concern. And you saw what happened to England in that World Cup uh, in that World Cup final, like it was, like it's incredible what they did in that World Cup and like genius from Rossi that um, you can almost start, uh, bring on, you can start a game and then bring on a bench that is almost better than the starters. So how you combat that tactics, they come into it. But at the end of the day, when you've got quality coming on like that, you've got to try and, I suppose you've got to try and match that. Um, and whether the quality you have on the bench is, as good as the guys guys coming on, um, that probably dictates. So um, it's a tough one. Like, and that's why that's why that bomb squad was so successful. Do you think? Um, yeah, that's that's the bomb squad. Obviously, I mean, Brad, I mean, you coach as well. Like with coaching now, let's say you come against the box. Do you think you'll see a lot of teams going? Listen, I might have to because normally you'd be like the strong scrum who starts up first, and the more dynamic guy comes off the bench. Do you think you might go a situation when they go? Listen, you come against the box. You might have to sacrifice being the dynamic, the Carl oh, Sinclair, exactly. someone in that sort of body. You have got two very strong scrimmages because you come against Ox, you have Steven Kitsov coming at you, so there's no rest part. So you think we'll see that change sort of coaching against the box going, we're going to go two out and out scrimmers here. We might sacrifice the guy with the flashy hands, but <laughs> otherwise you're not going to win games against the box. Absolutely. Um, and it's, you, you'd 100% do that. You'd go, right, well, the scrums, that's important. That's what's coming on. So we'll sacrifice maybe a more mobile um, so you'll pick your more mobile player or skillful player and you'll pick you'll pick your best scrummages. Or, you know, if they are starting, say, Ox and Chair and, and Kitsov's coming on, you might you might start with the guy that you plan to be on the bench and bring your stronger scrummage on at the end of the game. It's just it's kind of all it's all tactics really. I, I like Cook's question there because I think we, we get into a stage where people feel like players that offer a lot more around the park um make more sense, especially if if they're specialists like hookers or tight head props or loose head props. But effectively, a prop's primary job is to scrum. Now, you're a coach. Would you sacrifice a scrummaging prop to, to get a lot more for, for the team in terms of ball carrying, passing, attacking breakdown? Or are you always going to advocate for a solid set piece prop? Let's not forget, set piece wins your games, Ben. Uh, that is um, so, so um, I would always, if you're going to pick a scrummaging prop that's less skillful, um, well, then you have to look at your back rows and you need to get your carriers from your back row. Um, but it's all about balance and what you pick for me. And then, I mean, obviously, I mean, like, I mean, with you obviously coaching all the way out in Hong Kong, um, how are the conditions there? Do you also try and do this set piece dominant? Yeah, it was, uh, we, we dominated when, when we, when we, when Hong Kong played. So the only teams we used to, we didn't struggle, but was parity was Japan. When we came up against Japan, we knew we had to be really good. But in terms of playing the other teams, we definitely got that mindset and that dominance. And it used to also contribute to us winning games. 
I mean, the URC has seen 191 scrums this year. Um, 44 have resulted in penalties and there have been 31 scrum resets. Walk me through this. Yeah, like, first of all, I'd be... If, if we took the scrum out, I mean, a scrum is for people, men, women of all shapes, sizes. So yeah. I think that's the unique thing and that's what makes rugby special. Um, in terms of, of referees, they're going to get it wrong. But I think for a coach, as long as they're consistent in what they do and the way they ref it, you can plan for that. So we preview referees in advance and we see what he's, you know, he's high, what he gives away, his highest penalties. It might be collapse, it might be angles. So we can tactically plan for that. But... <clears throat> What worked, what worked really well is really well when I was in Hong Kong, we played in a competition called Global Rapid Rugby with the Western Force were involved and the Falk had a team in. But a rule they had was a scrum had to be set and engaged within 30 seconds. So the ref, the ref would literally watch his clock and if it wasn't, it was a free, free kick straight away. Um, and you had to play away. You couldn't scrum again. So you got a free kick and you had to tap and go and play. Um, I think the other thing is for refs just to make their decisions quicker, whatever it is. Um, you know, so if, if he's not quite sure, you can reset it again. But as soon as there's another collapse, just make a call. Rich, I've got to ask, I mean, um, as, a, as a fellow forward, um, especially what is, what is the worst? Is it when the 10 doesn't uh, find touch after a long penalty, after a penalty? Or <laughs> is it this one where you've been scrumming, a brutal scrum, and as you pop your head out to go and hit the next rug, some back has knocked it on and then it goes, scrum again. I think it's the last, yeah, it's your second one. It's when a back knocks it on and you've just come out of scrum and you're like, guys, what's going on here? Like, <laughs> yeah, but I've heard about the Connacht, Connacht ground. I mean, especially about the wind. Walk, walk us through playing at Connacht. One thing, one thing that Connacht do well is they, is they grow their homegrown, homegrown players. So they have fantastic academy structures um, and pathways through club rugby. So, that's a big strength. So that's where they where they get those young younger players from. And then you see the likes of like a Bandiaki coming in and, and adding the stardust. Yeah. I mean, you like said, like, and then you get players like, which is so exciting, players like Mac Hansen coming through and, and being one of the stars of of of, 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 of Ireland. But um, tell us, what's it like when staying in Connacht and, 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 and the stadium there and the atmosphere there? What, what, when you're playing, what is it like? Obviously, you've seen the growth of from when you were there to what it is now. Yeah, it's a special place. Um, like, as I said, by the weather, um, it can get very cold and wet, but it's a unique stadium because teams love, they don't like going there. So um, in terms of, of players, we, we train in that day in, day out and we get fairly used to it. But teams, when they come there, and big teams, especially when they come from big stadiums, they, you know, it was an advantage for us straight away. Um, the other thing is, the fans, the, the fans there are so passionate. So there's a very good connection between fans um, and the players because it's a smallish town. So you could be walking down the street and you could bump into anyone and you'd have a chat. Um, they're also very knowledgeable in their, in their rugby. I mean, before we wrap up, you, you just have to give us a funny story. Give us a story that just <laughs> gives us a decent... Because I know, I know every prop out there has got a story. Like there's that go-to story you share with people. No need to mention names, but it would be great if you do. But give us a story that just wraps it up in style. I've got two, actually. Um, one was a, a fellow prop I played with um, was so tired that he hit a breakdown um, and he was lying on the ground and he actually, he actually threw up on, a, on, another, on another player of the opposition because he was that, <laughs> he was that tired. Um, and the other one was actually playing in a game and I was lying at the bottom of a rack and next to me I just heard like this massive like not fight but argument break out and one of, the, one of our teammates had kissed the opposition on the forehead at the bottom of a rack so yeah just <laughs> some shenanigans going on um, but yeah there's probably you know some just some funny stories off the top of my head you, 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 you think the scrum is the, is the, the dog the, the place, the rock is clearly where, if Brett said, that's the most darkest place to be. Just vomit and uh, getting kissed. Yeah. 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 Brett, thank you so much for your time. This has been absolutely fantastic. Um, we've enjoyed no every, everything you've told us. We've learned quite a bit about the scrum. Thanks, mate. No, no worries, Brett. So much for having me on, eh? Just like the game of rugby, you two can get better at playing the bounce in life. How? We call it Change Science, and you can find out all about it right here on the Change Exchange.